There we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is Edmonton Global Shapers State of the City podcast episode number one. Yay! Yay. We can hear the tumbleweeds kind of coming in. <laughs> uh, my name is Iman Khan. I'm a member of the local Global Shapers Hub, and I'm also your host for the evening tonight. Uh, we are going to begin a series of semi-regular podcasts with fascinating Edmontonians who are 35-ish and under. Over the course of this series, we'll get to know each individual on a personal level, their journey, and why they chose to make Edmonton home. We'll ask them fun facts about their favorite spots in Edmonton, but also their thoughts on current events. Uh, so if without further ado, our first guest, he is one of the city's up and coming movers and shakers. He is also one of the friendliest city councillors across this entire continent. Please welcome uh, Mr. Andrew Knack of Ward 1 in Edmonton. Yay! <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Thanks for that introduction. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Uh, I mean, we had to hype you up somehow, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Andrew, starting off, like, how's your day? I mean, what's going on? Like, how are you feeling right now? Are you yeah, working at home? Are you, uh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. No, it's, it's, it's uh, odd. Yeah, working from home primarily during, uh, during this pandemic. And uh, it's, it's enlightening a bit <laughs> in the sense of you, you get a sense of, um, you know, what, what you, sort of what use you actually are <laughs> to people and, and in some cases aren't uh, um, and uh, I, I've learned that a bit I would have thought I was going to get a ton of different calls and emails from people um, hasn't been nearly as much as I thought it w was going to be and so it's more actually reaching out to try to engage folks and and talk about what's happening obviously there's there's never been anything quite like this in in many people's lifetimes and so knowing where to go for information um where to go for support you know it's uh, for some people this is uh, really challenging you know I, I i i've said you know i'm a bit of an introvert so for me this is a little bit easier um and and but i know that there are folks who it's challenging from just not being able to go outside because they're staying at home, they're isolating for, you know, uh, families with kids who are now sort of in, you know, and parents who are trying to work while their kids are at home. Uh, that can be challenging. And, and then for seniors as well. It's, so it's, it's certainly a, a really interesting world to be a part of right now. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we're able to help in, in any, any way possible, but, um, yeah, it's also making you realize um, how you can do things differently and uh, how much you sort of get used to being in doing things one way all the time. And you just you just do it that way over and over again because that's the way it's always been done. And this forces people to get outside of their comfort zone a bit and to look for new ways to do whatever it is they need to do each and every day. And I think the last thing is, you know, and, and I think it's for everyone is it gives you that uh, renewed appreciation and respect for all of the folks who are working on our front lines each and every day from our healthcare professionals to, you know, our retail staff, to our first responders, to our transportation, you know, our transit drivers and the, those who are driving our, our trucks who are providing us with the goods and services. So um, you, you just realize how fortunate we are to be so, you know, surrounded by people who are always willing to uh, help improve their city, their province, their country, and, and putting themselves, putting everyone else before themselves. Oh, wow. You covered a lot of bases there, and we'll touch <laughs> on each of those topics shortly. Um, sure. One of the things, I mean, I wanted to even better understand is, I mean, you've lived through more than one recession, right? So it's not mm -hmm. just a current one with the oil prices plus COVID. So that's like a double whammy, but also yeah. 2007, 2008. And I'm sure um, we'll get to uh, like a bit about your family and background as well. But I'm sure like some of your f friends, family, relatives, they probably also experienced a super recession that we had in the early 1980s. So yeah, yeah I I'd love to kind of hear a bit more about that, like as we kind of get into it. Um, sure. But before that, more importantly, Many of our many of our viewers are probably like super interested uh, beyond just COVID, beyond just oil apocalypse. Uh, we're just in, we're interested in you. What is the story of Mr. Andrew Knack of Edmonton? 
Are you are you originally from Edmonton, by the way? So born in Edmonton uh, at the Misericordia Hospital, but actually grew up just west in the city of Spruce Grove and uh, was there for a little over almost 18 years, a little over 18 years, and, uh, and then moved in in, I think it was February 2002. So we're, we're actually getting very close to that point where I've uh, officially lived in Edmonton longer than I lived in Spruce Grove. Sometime later this year, I'll, I'll pass that official halfway mark. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's been, don't it's let the electorate story. know that. Don't tell yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's sort of the beauty of the city. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to live here very long before you sort of feel like an Edmontonian. And, and I mean, I think to be fair, when you live in the Edmonton metropolitan region, you, you still sort of feel like you're an Edmontonian. Yeah. I lived in Spruce right. Grove and, and we were a close community at the time. This, the city was, was fairly small, you know, 10,000 people or so. And uh, and it's grown and grown, but but you still sort of felt that strong connection to Edmonton because that was the spot that people went to every day. You know, if they had to go to work or you know for for recreation for fun, that's where you went to. So, if you have to come to Edmonton for everything, you should have just like moved here sooner. I feel like what's the <laughs> point, right? Uh, no, I mean that that makes total sense. Like as as the prosperity in this province expanded a lot of people started coming in from all over canada and even beyond right like even if you look at parts of edmonton my part the southeast uh a lot of you know newcomers first generation canadians and even people in other parts of the city who are coming from the surrounding towns right so edmonton has definitely grown a lot since i've got here i think when i came in like 2006 it was something like 700 750 ish thousand somewhere mm -hmm. around there and at one point it came close to a million. So has the city definitely really kind of grown like since you kind of came in around 2002? Yeah, it's, you know, I remember part of why we moved into the city. You know, I had uh, now been at U of A for a few months. I started at the U of A, U of a my first year in 2001, September. Uh, but also by that point, you know, my, my mother had been working uh, in the city every day. My dad was um, actually... Uh, working with Landmark uh, Master Builders, selling homes in uh, Lewis Estates, which at the time uh, was, you know, essentially dirt. <laughs> uh, well, it, it started to, have, by that point in time, actually, 10 years later, they had already started to have a number of homes up. But um, it, it's interesting because, you know, every day, all three of us were coming into the city. We were spending our, the majority of our, of our awake time <laughs> in the city mm -hmm. of Edmonton. And yet every night we would be coming home to Spruce Grove. And by that point, because all three of us were there, um, it just made sense to finally be in the city. And so moved into the city, they kept going to work. And it was for me, particularly going to UVA, uh, it was a lot easier to uh, be in the city and, you know, be able to rely on our public transit system instead of having to rely on finding a carpool uh, from somebody in my, my uh, in Spruce Grove who was coming in. So um, yeah, it's, it's been fascinating to see it grow. And I bring up uh, the community of Lewis Estates in the West End because that was, since my dad was there and he was selling homes in that area, you know, I saw that community, one of the first suburban communities, um, you know, the Anthony Henday hadn't, it was really just, you know, at that point there had been some of it completed, uh, but it hadn't all been done. And you look now just, I mean, it's about 20 years later now since I've been right. in um but it's drastically different you know the from the completion of the henday it's resulted in so much more outward growth in the city and and uh really fascinating i remember when i you know when i was growing up in spruce grove and we would go to west edmonton mall for, to go see a movie or something um you know you you think about that drive home later at night and it felt like it was an eternity probably number one because i was younger um <laughs> but, but two because yeah. there actually was quite a distance from yeah. you know the western edge of edmonton to where the city of spruce grove started and now you know you <laughs> the western edge is at 231st street you're within spruce grove it feels like in 10 minutes it doesn't really even feel like there's a disconnect between those two areas anymore I think it's uh it probably has to do perhaps with urban sprawl. This city in yeah. particular, it seems like it's just spreading in all directions. Like when we 
a lot of times in uh, common conversations, people say like the number one industry might be oil and gas, but number two is definitely residential construction, right? So <laughs> no matter what's happening, what's going on, there's always somebody somewhere building a house, building something or preparing it for like 50 years down the road, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of fascinated to see how the city expands. Even if I'm not mistaken, um, yourself, uh, your staff and colleagues, you guys are also working on a regional transit plan to integrate mm -hmm. a lot of like the smaller towns. Uh, would you mind perhaps maybe sharing a bit about that? Yeah, it's it's actually really exciting. So the the Regional Transit Services Commission has been working and so the 13 municipalities that make up the Edmonton Metropolitan Region have been working on a plan to see if we could all come together and really run one system. Uh, so where we're at today is is 12 of the 13 municipalities agreed to to move forward with this and uh, which is exciting news and and one would hope that as we get into the further steps we'll get at all 13 on board because I think again you go back to most people if you're living in Spruce Grove if you're living in a different city in the region or a town or one of the counties you don't really, I, again, I, I feel like a lot of us just sort of reckon, it's, we're just, it's the Edmonton region. <laughs> and, and you don't really care that you've just crossed the border. Um, so if you're using transit, why should you have to have nine different systems to connect you across the region? You really should just have one. Right. And, and so it's exciting to see that happening. I think we're starting to see, that's gonna shift how we grow as a city and as a region. Uh, that fits really well into the city plan that the city's been working on, which is planning for our city of 2 million, right? We're, we're just about to hit 1 million people. And we for, we're already beginning our plan of what does the city of Edmonton look like with 2 million people? And it's the city plan really becomes the guiding document for everything that our city staff will do. And, uh, and it helps direct, you know, where we're going to spend our, you know, always limited resources and what we should be spending that on and how that will help contribute to this city of 2 million people. You know, do we want to grow out as fast as we've grown out? The city sure. plan is actually saying, no, probably not. You know, we're not even going to expand our boundaries, anything beyond what they already are. So how do you fit a million people into that? You can only fit so many in the currently undeveloped areas and you're right on, which is that that also means to fit the full million, we're going to have to grow up within our mature neighborhoods. I live in a mature neighborhood here that will need to go through change because it's already gone through a lot of change in the last 20 or 30 years where we've seen populations drop and um, we need to help combat that because that impacts your local businesses, that impacts your schools, that impacts just the general vibrancy of a neighborhood when you have fewer people living in a space. Yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense. On that note, I actually want to ask you two follow-up questions. Um, you mentioned like the need for the city to plan for the next two million people, but one of the concerns that a lot of young people nowadays often have is uh, issues regarding safety, regarding personal space and things like that, but also things regarding inclusivity. So for instance, one of the biggest elephants in the room, at least in a lot of uh, prairie cities, is how do we ensure that all demographics in all communities, such as people who live in the inner city, seniors, the, the disabled community, people who come from you know, historically marginalized groups, such as the indigenous population, how do we, in your opinion, what can we do to ensure that they have not only a voice in the process, but then that they can also be part of this future growth? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a big question because it's not something you immediately resolve overnight. You know, right. it took us decades to get to where we are today as the city of almost 1 million people. Uh, but at the same time, we can't wait decades to address all of the inequity that's sort of built over the course of those those same decades. Um, so th I think really that's the point of something like what the city plan was. The, the city plan was drafted not just by a bunch of planners who are phenomenal, I'm glad we have a bunch of planners uh, and engineers who bring that, but they went out and went and actively engaged groups from across the city. And not just your standard, you know, city, you know, run town hall where they book a community league hall, they throw up a couple boards on the, on the wall and say, you know, write down your feedback on a sticky note. 
You know, they went and actively sought out feedback from seniors. They went to actively reach out to groups like the Accessibility Advisory Committee, the City of Edmonton Youth Council, Edmonton Next Gen, uh, Edmonton, you know, go to groups like Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers, and, and any group, stakeholder group that you can imagine, they went and actively reached out to in helping to create this new city plan. So we know that all of those gaps that have existed over the years, getting to the point where we are today, um, they ideally should not exist in this new plan because this plan was created with everyone and not for everyone. And there's a very important distinction there. When you're creating a plan and say, well, we're gonna create a plan that works for everyone, but you don't actually reach out to people and find out what do you need to see to make sure we're addressing everything. Um, you get a very different policy document than if you say, help us draft this together. Give us your, help us better understand what needs to be done. Help us draft this. And then, you know, when you're drafting it, you go back and check in and say, here's what we've got so far. How does this look? Is this actually hitting what it needs to hit? And ideally, as you go along those steps, they're going to say, yeah, absolutely right. Or yes, good, good, you know, it looks pretty good, but can you make this change or this change? And so, you know, there are still, council hasn't formally adopted this plan yet. It will likely be done uh, later in 2020, but there will continue to be further check-in points to make sure that before council makes a final decision, everyone who we feel needs to be involved, which is really everyone in the city, um, from a variety of stakeholder groups will have had their input and helped to create the plan that we're looking at. You know, you uh, like that's, it's fascinating you mentioned that. When I have conversations with some of my friends, family, relatives from across Canada and the US, one thing constantly comes up, which is that the municipal uh, leadership, so the city councillors and the office of the mayor, the city manager, everyone's surprisingly very accessible. Like, <laughs> Even this conversation, having it with a local elected official, it's extremely rare in many municipalities, right? So if you haven't already checked out the City of Edmonton's programs, check it out at edmonton.ca. Find out who your counselor is. Uh, if, you're, if you have anything, any areas of concern, you know, send an email, talk about what you're interested in and propose ideas and get involved in the process. Um, what I do sense, Mr. Knack, is someone who is very articulate, who may have planned a political career beforehand. Do I, when did you decide to join the downtown elite and become a city councilor? What is the journey? <laughs> well, so here's the funny thing. First of all, call me Andrew. It's all good. This is a nice casual conversation here. Um, but no, I, you know, I actually hadn't always planned to run for public office. Um, oh, I first decided to, I've always been engaged politically, uh, but growing up, most of my engagement was focused on provincial and federal politics. I was far more interested in that than local government. And uh, I mean, to the point where, you know, when there was an election happening, uh, you know, my family and I would gather around the TV like, you know, other families would gather around for the Stanley Cup finals, right? You, you get up, you get all your snacks, yeah. you get your food, and then you just sit in front of the TV for the next four hours watching the result come in. And, and that was exciting to me. I loved, I loved watching that. And um, so that's always stuck with me. And that, so I had an interest in it. But I, as mentioned, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm far less articulate than you gave me credit for. And uh, I, I never thought I'd be the person, yeah, I never thought I'd be the person in front of others. Um, but it was when I was 23, I had just graduated from the UVA. I was in um, the, my degrees in commerce. So I was in the UVA School of Business. And uh, I came out and I had actually just started a job. I worked my way through university uh, you know, retail primarily, and uh, had just started with a new company. Uh, I was working with the company Bose. Uh, the one I've got my Bluetooth speaker on here, but hopefully sound a little clearer. Uh, and um, sorry to break into, but they're uh, shutting down all their retail locations. Bose. I know. Yeah, they're they're oh, all gone. Now. All of them. All all the ones in Canada, at least. That's what I heard. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that's which was sad to me. So uh, I used to to manage the, the store in West Edmonton Mall. And so actually, oh, hey. when I first got that job, which was just a few months after graduating, I was in Boston for training. 
And I remember that I had to check out of my room early and I had a few hours to wait between when I had to check out and when the plane, when I was going to get the shuttle to go to the airport. And it was about July, June, July of 2007. So just a few months before that election. And I remember thinking about the election upcoming. And I thought, well, who am I going to vote for? Because again, I've always been engaged, but hadn't followed municipals closely. And I sort of was doing a bit of research and, and I wasn't feeling inspired at the time uh, for a couple of reasons. And the other piece was that, you know, you often don't see younger people run for city council, particularly in larger cities because of the requirements that it takes to run just the budget that, it, you know, if you're just starting out, how do you build a network and, and get the resources you need to compete? Donors are the so, <laughs> Yeah, that was the number one issue from, and, you know, it wasn't the desire to go door knock and that was there, but you know, raising money is huge. So I remember sitting in that, that uh, lobby and I did some research and found out, well, you know, it only costs a hundred bucks and you need 25 signatures to get your name on a ballot. And I sort of thought to myself and said, well, if I'm not feeling excited about anyone and I want to see this change that I'm talking about, why not give it a try? Now, I had no idea what it took to run a campaign. This was a uh, young person who thought he knew far more than he actually did, who obviously had a bit of an ego that needed to be brought down to a reality. Uh, but you know what I said? I, I ran. And uh, I ran and I lost horribly in 2007. <laughs> Uh, I, there were at the time we were still in six wards and you would elect two counselors per ward. So, you know, if I was trying to be generous, I would say, well, I finished third of four. Uh, but if you actually look at the vote totals, I think I had about 10% of the vote total uh, thing of the, uh, the top two finishers. So I was well, well off. Um, but it was through that experience of getting involved with community leagues, actually getting to go to doors that I really I sort of woke up the next morning and thought, even though, you know, I'd spent my life in commerce, in business, I wanted to have my own business, that marketing was my, my major, I thought that's where I was going to go. I sort of woke up the next morning after that election and said, I want to serve in some capacity. And I didn't know if that meant running again or, or, uh, or trying to move down that path or, or just working in public service in some way, but it sort of changed my, my thinking. And so I tried again in 2010 still lost again uh but came a yeah. bit closer um and and then i finally tried a third time in 2013 and uh was very fortunate that people gave me the opportunity to serve them and uh but it's it was a long journey from when i decided in 2007 but this was not a lifelong dream originally yeah i mean it wow it's politics i feel like is one of those things where a lot of people who tend to succeed, they're the ones who don't necessarily plan for it. They tend to come from different backgrounds and experiences. They're doing lots of things in their communities, but at some point, you know, for some of them, they hit that glass ceiling, if you will. They realize that, hey, in order for me to get certain things done, I have to be that change I want to see in society, right? So we're really, I mean, there are a lot of people, especially your constituents of Ward 1 in the city of Edmonton, who I'm sure are very happy that like, you know, you kept going and now they have the privilege of being represented by you. Did you ever feel like when you did win like the third in like the third attempt, when you got to that, when you got to city hall that first day, all nice, happy in your suit with your backpack on and everything. <laughs> did it ever feel kind of intimidating? Like, Oh, like, yes. what am I doing here? Who am I to be with, you know, all these people? Yes, because uh, again, you know, at that time I got elected, so it was 2013, I was 29 and, um, you know, I, I had, you know, I had a university education, I, I had managed a, a business for many years, uh, so it's not that I felt uh, my education didn't uh, provide that, but you come into a place where, particularly in 2013, the only other sort of younger person on city council was our mayor, <laughs> Mayor Don Iveson, <laughs> who got elected when he was 28 in 2007. And so outside of him, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by people who are a little further on in their careers who have been either, you know, long time serving city councillors like Ed Gibbons and Brian Anderson 
and at even that time you think about uh, you know Ben Henderson and, and Tony Katarina and these folks who have been around for a long time you know I'd seen their names over and over again um, and they also had successful careers and yeah it's, absolutely I show up and and I sort of to myself felt like I felt like I almost didn't deserve to be there and I had to make um, you know I sort of went into this with the mindset of saying I have the most to prove I have to work harder than anyone else because um, otherwise folks are going to say well they didn't deserve to be here in the first place I wanted to show folks that that you know that I could be here um, but yeah it's still I mean still to this day I mean I'm just almost we're six and a half years in uh, and yeah there's times where you still sort of feel like okay I'm you know, I'm still one of the younger, I'm the second youngest on council uh, right now. Yeah, you so, are. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the 35-ish category because I'm 36, so, so we'll count it. Ah, uh, cool. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I still feel a little bit at times like I can be out of place, um, even though now at, in the 2017 election, four people were elected in their 30s, um, which was, I think, one of the first times I've seen that that I can recall of in, in the history of that. So... Um, and it's not just an age piece. It's just certainly the fact that uh, my background was very different. I didn't have large networks. You talk about fundraising. The, you know, the reason I, I was uh, able to fundraise money in 2013 was not because I knew what I was doing, because I didn't have those networks. It was a combination of people knew that I was running and um, I had obviously done enough that people felt, okay, you know, we'll, we'll give this person a shot. Um, and so the funding sort of came to me, which is very rare in a situation like this. Usually it's the river, you have to go find it. So there are certain things that I sort of fell into that almost again made me feel a little bit like, oh, should I, should I be here? But, um, you know, I, what I realized, I mean, I'll, while I think that at times, you know, what I do realize is that, in fact, we need everyone, including folks who think like I thought because chances are their voices will be equally as important to the debates as somebody who's been working their entire life to get to that or building mm -hmm. everything up to that point because the life experience each of us bring are really critical to helping inform our decisions and making better decisions. And that's the beauty of municipal government in Alberta because there's no parties. So we get to hear all the perspectives from across the ideological spectrum. And I think that only makes better decisions overall because of it. Yeah, completely. In fact, I mean, I, I feel like uh, some of the provincial and federal parties do try to push their influence, but you're right, like uh, everybody runs on their own mandate. Just because someone was a former volunteer or staffer of some other party, it doesn't mean anything. People have to present their own ideas, convince their own supporter base, get the signatures themselves, the donors, the whole nine yards, right? So that's one of the things that we definitely benefit from. Uh, there are a number of municipalities, even, there are some even in like out east and like in other parts of Canada that shall not be named, where they do have uh, municipal mm -hmm. politics, right? So I feel like that the way that the city of Edmonton has developed their municipal institutions, it definitely gives us a cutting edge. If you don't mind me asking, one of the, one of the questions that a lot of times young people who are in and from Edmonton or from the surrounding towns, whether they're from Nisku or maybe they're from... Gibbons, maybe they're from Spruce Grove or Sherwood Park on the other end. One of the one of the things that we struggle with sometimes is trying to define what Edmonton is. So we know it's a city. We know it's a very transitory uh, city. Uh, but it, it's kind of how, what is like the overarching culture or some of the cultural themes of the city. If we look at cities like Montreal, they have Formula One, the arts, music. Ottawa is the capital. They have festivals. Toronto is you know, the six, it's Drake and all of these things, right? What, what are some of like the unique insights you can offer about the culture of the city as it has developed? Like things that young people who are watching this can be perhaps a bit proud of. Yeah, I mean, wow, there's, you know, and, and that's something I think that we, we definitely don't talk about enough, particularly with those uh, in that young, younger demographic. We all, we sometimes struggle. I think for many years, the city struggled with retaining uh, post-secondary graduates. So, you know, we have phenomenal post-secondary institutions. We have some of the best talent you can get between all of the post-secondaries. And then 
what we sometimes found is folks would say, well, great, I got my fantastic education and now I'm going to leave to go somewhere else because I can't accomplish what I want here or it doesn't have enough here. And I think that's, that's certainly changing overall. I think, you know, from you, you talk about Ottawa and festivals. Well, I, I think it's hard to argue that anyone does festivals better than the city of Edmonton because we do it year round all of these different festivals that attract people from far and wide from, you know, the second largest fringe festival in the world here in Edmonton, right. Mm -hmm. To something like heritage fest or heritage um, festival that um, draws in hundreds of thousands of people just over a weekend. But then we also think about everything that we do now in the winter, because we're really embracing the fact that we are a winter city and contrary to popular belief, it's not freakishly cold most of the time. There's a handful of days where it is. And I, you know, I say this because I bike most days. So I get to go outside almost every day in the winter. And you realize that when you're regularly outside, that the city isn't very cold overall most days. And so we've, we've recognized that and said, well, let's get people out then in the winter and do these festivals. You know, you think about deep freeze, which is, you know, right, you know, at that point where you feel you need that break, you've been inside, it's dark all the time. And then you go out to a festival like that. And so I think you look, at, we, we do that very well. I think we do entrepreneurship very well in the city too. I think if you want to start a business here, if you want to create something here in, in virtually any industry, this is a place that you can do it now. And it's something we're really trying to work with on, uh, with, with younger Edmontonians, not just, although there's a lot of work in sort of the tech and innovation uh, ecosystem. Uh, I think more broadly, we are recognizing that no matter what it is you want to do, there are folks, you know, maybe you have the idea, but you don't have the talent to set up the tech side. Well, there's folks who can do that. And, and likewise, maybe you have the talent to set something up, but you don't have the idea. There's folks here. And so there's lots of different things you can do to uh, thrive economically at Edmonton. And then I think the other piece is just, you realize the, the community nature of it. We are, going to be a city of 1 million people likely sometime this year and yet at the same time I think for a lot of folks they we still we are a a bit of a small town community still in what has become a big city and yeah. we haven't really lost that and, and I mentioned that you know at the very beginning that you know, I still haven't been here. I, I've been here just a little under half my life compared to Spruce right. Grove. Yeah, I think for a lot of folks, you know, you're in Edmonton and within five minutes, you've become an Edmontonian. If you've just moved to Edmonton, you're an Edmontonian. Um, yeah. And it's because we want you to succeed. We want you to thrive. We're going to connect with you. And, and no matter what it is you want to do, we talk about communities. It's not just community leagues, although we've got a phenomenal community league system. It's, it's different cultural groups. It's different religious groups. It's, you know, you name it, there's communities there that want to get you involved and engaged and helping to build a better city. And so um, I think there's always somebody willing to help if you've got an idea, whether that's on the business side, whether that's on the community building side, there are other folks here who are willing to help make that happen. And I, and I don't see that in other spots. You talk to people from other cities and, and you do get a sense that that desire to help and create is, is, is very unique to what we have here. Uh, no matter, I think a lot of cities strive for that, but I think we do really show it time and time again. For our viewers, one thing a lot of people don't know is that the city of Edmonton in many regards compared to many, many other municipalities is very unique in that almost every single one of the 166 neighborhoods across the entire city, they either have their own community league or are partnered up with a neighbor, uh, nearby neighborhood and they have like their own small mini community center you could book it for weddings food do whatever you want host birthdays like it's very well integrated and on top of that we have our three levels of uh what do you call it like the recreational facilities so terwilliger um castle downs meadows rec millwoods rec there are a lot of these like recreation centers that are city owned where you could play hockey you could play soccer you could swim you can have meetings some of them have um, fast food restaurants and lots of other like some of them have library branches inside and this is something that you don't really see in a lot of other cities like I grew up in Scarborough which is now East Toronto right like a lot of people out there would kill for resources like that so the city of Edmonton 
um, particularly in, in not only City Hall, but the civil staff, the city manager, uh, their team, a lot of people really try to make this a very inclusive environment. On that note, um, perhaps we can talk about like a few of like the more recent events. So mm -hmm. as some of our viewers may or may not know, uh, recently there was a little bit of restructuring with regards to some of the entities within the city of Edmonton. Um, mm -hmm. in this conversation, what I'm referring to is the increase of funding for an organization called Edmonton Global. They're not part of Global Shapers, no affiliation. It's just global is a very popular term for organizations <laughs> nowadays, right? So they have now been tasked with the responsibility of promoting economic opportunities in, for Edmonton and the surrounding areas in other geographies across the globe. So uh, Andrew, would you mind like perhaps telling us a bit about your relationship with Edmonton Global and some of the other organizations that in, pardon me for saying this, but that kind of, they either fall under the city or answer to the city, if you will. Mm -hmm. Would you mind telling us a bit about the relationship and dynamics with these organizations and uh, how you guys are collaborating to better promote the city in other geographies? Yeah, absolutely. So Edmonton Global really has taken that role as the group that will promote the entire Edmonton metropolitan region to the world. And so we joined up with our partnering municipalities. We all came together. Um, we're all on the board uh, of, of Edmonton Global. And again, the, the role of Edmonton Global is to bring companies into the region. They're not going to single out Edmonton versus any one of our other regional yeah. partners. They just want to get the companies to come here. So when there are big events going on in the world, um, Edmonton Global is usually at those events, having a presence to draw people here. If there's companies looking to set up, looking to create a new headquarters, you know, Edmonton Global's out there promoting why the Edmonton region is the right place to be. And what they do is they'll work with each of the local municipalities economic development groups so in the case of the city of edmonton we have edmonton economic development corporation that can serve as as one of those uh almost they hand off and they work together on certain things but they each have their own um role to play and right. global is again really meant to drive drive out to the world and, and go out and build our brand connect people, show people why Edmonton is the place to be uh, and the Edmonton region is the place to be for whatever industry they're in. And they recognize the other pieces as mentioned, they're not here to pick um, which city gets uh, each business that wants to come in, but right. rather to tailor uh, the, what, what each business is looking for. So if you have a particular business that specializes in one area and it's a better fit for one of the other partners in the region that's not Edmonton, they're going to go and work and bring them to the region because we know, and this all started because it, we finally got to the point that as a region, we had to recognize that we were busy competing against each other for business. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we were falling behind the rest of the world. There were some uh, excellent studies done and reports done. The, the best one probably talking about what's called be ready or be left behind, which which really, if I can boil it down to anything, said that if we're not operating as one, there's tens if not hundreds of other regions across the world that are working together and are going to take our business. Um, mm -hmm. So we can you know, fight over the small piece of pie or we can say, why don't we just grow it? <laughs> why don't we go attract more and more businesses here and actually all be successful because of that growth? Um, and, and so I think the region generally has understood that now that um, if we're busy bickering against each other and not working together and not working on things like shared investment for shared benefit, the rest of the world's moving on. Uh, and, and this really is evident in spots like the tech and innovation world. You, uh, right. you know, I'm, I was at the um, collision conference in Toronto last year. And, you know, when you learn about what's happening, not just in spots like the Mars Discovery District, but you learn at what, you know, the city of Toronto is partnered with Waterloo for their innovation work. Well, really? so you think to yourself, well, wait a second, you know, can't Toronto do it on their own, you know, with being such a large city? And no, they even recognize that in order to compete globally, they need to tap into expertise that maybe they don't have to the level they would like. And so if we're busy, again, fighting within the region, 
groups like that, which have recognized they need to fight on a global scale and compete on a global scale, are already doing that work. And I mean, we, we might even have to start thinking more critically around our relationship with the city of Calgary, too, and that region, because again you think organized. what's going on <laughs> well and and we do work with the you know innovation uh, innovate edmonton has been working with platform calgary to start developing an innovation corridor strategy but we you know especially with this evolving uh world with the the new oil and gas economy uh all the more reason for us to really be working more directly with spots like calgary because you know, together as a province, we still are a much smaller province population wise compared to some of these large metropolitan cities. Yeah. And um, if we're not remembering that, then what are we missing out on because these larger centers can encourage people to come in. So uh, Edmonton Global's helped really get people behind that. And now I think the next step is is now that we're working more cohesively as a region, now we really need to start working with Calgary and thinking about working closer together between the two big cities and really as a province so that we can compete on some of these uh, major issues. Yeah, I mean, even within our Global Shapers Hub, we actually had some conversations with uh, Chris McLeod of Edmonton Global, and he mentioned mm -hmm. some of like the amazing innovations that they're working on, their, their projects, like... Uh, they did a series of interviews and a number of other materials with uh, notable individuals from across the metro area. And they're just, I, I, can't, I can't do it justice. Maybe at one point we'll ask Chris to come on here as well. Yeah. It's phenomenal the work that they're doing. Shout out Edmonton Global. Uh, just for our viewers, I want to clarify that nothing Mr. Knack has said it should be misconstrued as an endorsement for the Calgary Flames. Uh, we still hate them. They're a terrible team. So... <laughs> We'll work with them, we'll happily collaborate with them, but uh, we will neither confirm or deny our support uh, for their hockey team. So, you know, don't, don't write us angry messages, please. I probably shouldn't admit this, but when I was growing up, for whatever reason, um, when I was a kid, I liked to get the Calgary Flames more than the Oilers. And I, you know, because I don't know, I was a kid, I, like, I might have liked the jersey more. I liked the, I don't know what it was, but I just liked the, the Flames more. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I feel bad admitting that, but I, I feel like I also need to be honest because it's just that that was the group I watched when I was playing NHL on, you know, my Super Nintendo. I would always play the Flames instead of instead of the Oilers. Was it because like they were red, like it was like the fire and like Oilers? I are guess even though even though blue's my color, like I love, I've always loved blue's the color. So you would have thought maybe, but for whatever reason, that was the one. And uh, and now now of course I have to love the Oilers more, but uh, but I, I will admit I was younger, I I didn't. Well, at, at at the very least, he's not a Winnipeg Jets fan, so we'll we'll give him that. Um, Andrew, uh, so one one of the things that you know. Right now, there are a lot of things happening uh, with regards to global events, especially with regards to COVID-19. Um, yeah. If you're watching this 1,000 years in the future, it's a worldwide mm -hmm. disease that is going around. And because of that, a lot of businesses, industry, entire economies have kind of grinded to a halt. So, uh, Andrew, I'd love to hear your thoughts about kind of a bit of the timeline on when this was first emerging, uh, what were kind of like some of the decisions you guys, you yourself and your colleagues had to make at City Hall and just kind of what are even like some of the current things that City Hall in Edmonton is doing to make sure that you can continue to provide civil serv municipal services to people, uh, keep them engaged and also informed. Um, for the record, City of Edmonton is doing an amazing job. Again, if you want to learn more about Councillor Nack, please check him out on social media. Uh, I believe you're on Facebook, Twitter, maybe Instagram as well, Instagram, all as Andrew. TikTok, you name it there. Wow, now, I don't actually use TikTok to be fair. I have an account so I can watch everything, but I'm not creative enough for it. But uh, yeah, oh, LinkedIn, no anyone, pretty much any social media, I usually like to be there. Okay. Yeah, uh, guys, please check out uh, Counselor Nax, uh, like all of his social media accounts. And he's like providing amazing daily, uh, like daily, weekly updates on the evolving situation. So if you want kind of minute by minute updates, definitely check it out. But uh, yeah, Andrew, please, like we'd love to hear about when this first started happening and some of the things that you guys have been working on as a response to COVID-19. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because, you know, now that we're in it, it's sort of hard to think about. And, and, and yet, I mean, it's 
it's really only started for us that when I can really start to remember, remember myself thinking, oh, okay, something's, something's really starting to change. It was yeah. about three weeks ago, the week of March 9th, where, you know, I remember that week, uh, things really hadn't started too much in Edmonton, but it was becoming prominent enough that, you know, okay, well, I wasn't shaking hands at the beginning of my meeting, or if I was, I was being very attentive to not touch my face and wait until after the meeting, go wash my hands really quick. And but yet we were still sort of meeting as normal that that was we had our regular, regularly scheduled meetings. And, um, but as we got closer to the end of that week, we started to realize that, that something's really evolved quite quickly here. And uh, there was a special city council meeting on on March 13th, where, you know, we ended up sort of canceling a week's worth of meetings and sort of saying, okay, well, something, we need to spend more time and attention on this and, and let our let our city staff spend more time and attention. This is why I talked about the beginning, it's sort of times, um, I almost feel a little bit useless because at a time like this, it's actually less about the the politicians, the elected representatives, and it's more about the people who are helping run government services, whether it's municipally, provincially, or federally, and they need to go and focus their time and effort and resources on responding to this pandemic. And we don't need to spend as much time in a meeting of council talking about different policies because you have to get through this before you start worrying about new policies. So, uh, you know, it was that, that was the day that it really started. It'll be three weeks tomorrow where I were, you know, we had that meeting and I realized, yeah, something, something's going very different. And then, you know, started working from home uh, essentially that day on community events ended up getting canceled and, and it all really spiraled quite quickly after that mark uh, because uh, I had a bunch of events that weekend that all ended up getting canceled with, um, you know, over the course of about 48 hours. And, and now we're at this point where the city has declared a state of local emergency, which again really empowers our city staff, our city administration to go and make decisions without always having to come back to council for approval on some of these things. And, um, uh, and they've been doing, I think, a phenomenal job. And, you know, there's there's always going to be a couple of hiccups here and there because this is a ever-evolving situation that no matter how much you can prepare for, and the city actually had been doing preparation on states and local emergency and responding to emerging events um, a few years leading up, but you can still, until you're in it, it's hard to completely understand everything that's happening. So... Um, really, I think for the city, as the, the, the elected representative city council, it's more been trying to make sure we're sharing the information that's being shared with us, not trying to add our own commentary. They, you know, this is one of the few times where you don't really want elected representatives you know, offering their perspective or their idea. We've got health professionals. We've got experts who they are the voices you need to be hearing, right? You, you look at what's happening here in Alberta and Dr. Dina Hinshaw has become, I think, really the person that everyone goes to to say, this is the person I trust. This is the person I'm going to listen to. If she has something, if she has advice or recommendation, I'm going to take it seriously because she's, she's an expert in the area and also she's delivering that information in a very thoughtful, calm and measured way. And so it's actually a time like this, you need more folks like that and less folks like myself because you want everyone focused on one point of contact and so it's been really interesting to be a part of this again because like I say it's um, I haven't got a lot of people calling and emailing me each and every day um, I'm reaching out more than people are reaching out to me which is which is very unique it's usually the other way around people are happy to get in touch with you when they're not happy about the policy being discussed or a different issue um, but here I think most people are seeking out information from other resources yeah. You know, a, a lot of like in in normal days and times, it's like, counselor, why did you approve this info lot next to my house? Why did you allow them to cut the grass this high? Things like that. But right mm -hmm. now, in the thick of it, uh, in my opinion, I feel like City Hall, for the most part, most of the members, yourself included, are having a very mature response by keeping the politics out of it and kind of re like redirecting the focus towards the experts and professionals. Would you mind uh, perhaps uh, also sharing about some of the organizations that are kind of uh, really stepping up and getting involved in the process? So for oh, instance, wow. I know 
um, like AHS and many of like the local hospitals, they're stepping up. We've heard about the provincial and federal governments, they're instituting some programs and also like some local organizations like the community leagues, uh, many of the business associations and groups that are stepping up to, for instance, bring in uh, a lot of desperately needed materials. Would you mind perhaps like telling us a bit more about what I guess the entire community is also doing to help the cause? Yeah. Well, I think you've done a great job already highlighting a number <laughs> of the groups, right? We're, we're very fortunate in Edmonton that, you know, we have so many uh, nonprofit groups and social organizations and religious institutions who all have stepped up in, in their own way to help contribute to this. Um, I, I think we're a city that, you know, the term in it gets thrown around a lot because it's true. We are all in this together. Uh, but I think Edmonton is the type of city that really embodies that. Uh, and you see that from all of the work happening across every every area you could imagine. Like you say, local community leagues are doing work. But then you've got, um, again, I, I've seen feedback from different social organizations and nonprofits who had to close their doors but are offering online services. Or who are, you know, you've got groups like who are delivering food to uh, seniors who are in isolation, to healthcare workers who are busy working day in and day out and don't have time to go to a grocery store. Um, so, so you name it, somebody's involved. If you, can, if you think about your community in Edmonton and you think about whether it be that church or that community league or that local business, chances are they've been stepping up and doing what they can. And it's impressive because, you know, you think about the business community in particular who are going through one of the toughest times they may ever go through in their lives because businesses in many cases are just shut down. And yet many of these spots are still stepping up to help in any way possible um, to contribute. Again, whether that's connecting people to other resources, whether that's providing um, goods and services that they offer to those who need it more, more than they do, even when they might not know if they can keep all of their staff. So we've seen everyone um, step up in a way that I, I think you're, you're going to look back and see that it's going to set a new bar for what, uh, what we can expect of folks when we run into challenging times like this. I would say, just to add on to what you're saying, I would say that there are even like certain groups that I wouldn't have expected to step up that have yeah. stepped up. Yeah. Um, one group that I can reasonably say is universally despised is the CRA scammers. The ones are calling saying that, hey, you owe us this much money, give us your SIN number uh, and things like that. But they're not even calling, right? You don't even see the ads on social media about, hey, make $60,000 from home. Even those guys stopped, right? Even though ironically now everybody would kill for <laughs> those type of positions. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, just aside, like a lot of organizations and enti entities have really stepped up. And even a lot of Edmontonians, I'd say, we, if you go to, if you drive past like a random municipal park, maybe you'll see a few people here and there, but people are reasonably spaced apart. Once it, the message kind of came down from all levels of government that, hey, this is seriously happening. People can be asymptomatic and still carry it and mm -hmm. infect their grandparents or whoever else. Um, yeah, like people have surprisingly been very cooperative. There hasn't really been any chaos or riots of any nature within the entire city. So it's great to hear that like the city's all just kind of rallying around a central cause. Um, maybe we should talk about something on a lighter note. When times sure. are bright and sunny, uh, what is the counselor for Ward 1's favorite outdoor spot? And also their, your favorite restaurant in the city. Are there any mm. particular small businesses uh, in and around the first ward that you frequently hang out at? Places that perhaps you want to give a shout out to? Oh yeah, there's always so many good things. So favorite, we'll start with favorite outdoor spot. And um, uh, gosh, it's always tough. There's so many great things. I, I since I, I mentioned earlier that I bike most every day, um, so I, I just like our trail system um, and what we have in the city. That you really you can get from not just one end to the other end of the city, but now really throughout the region, the, the, whether it's the river valley trails, but even our internal uh, trail system that we have, it's just wonderful to be out in those spaces. Uh, it's a good way um, to unwind and, and get ready, both to get ready for the morning, I get a good bike ride in and, and, and to unwind at the end of the day, I love being on those trails. So 
that's sort of my, my favorite outdoors uh, thing to do because it just lets me, lets me enjoy what our city is. Oh, local. And on the local business side, there's always, I mean, it's hard because you, you don't want to be picking your favorite here. Right. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but I think we are, we are very fortunate in, in Edmonton to be uh, heavily supported by local businesses. I mean, I think whether it's, um, you know, uh, I live in the community of Jasper Park, so I have, you know, like the local bakery in the Bonton, or you go a little further out onto Stony Plain Road and you've got, whether it's different bakeries or restaurants, um, and and so I, I try to get around to a variety of spots and even outside the ward I mean um, you know I love desserts so I love going to spot like kind ice cream in in uh, just in the Ritchie area which uh, is phenomenal um, so there's that's the beauty of again Edmonton and we've got this we we're a bunch of a collection of small communities and and every small area has their own sort of unique. Um, features that they provide um gosh yeah i i would be hard to pay you know my favorite thing i think you know yeah. we're, we're fortunate uh riverbend gardens and so i know it's not a restaurant but i'm going to give them credit because i like to eat at home a lot um uh, i'm i'm cheap so <laughs> i like to try, like to try and save my money and eat at home as often as i can uh riverbend gardens uh, official that doesn't want to bill the taxpayers for meals <laughs> or business meals <laughs> color me That's, surprised there <laughs> you go so so riverbend gardens does a uh uh weekly delivery that uh, of vegetables that i pick up and uh and they do it throughout the summer and actually they also do it during the winter now and i love i love getting those fresh veggies because then it just it's it's great because it's grown here in the city um you know we don't have farms like that really outside of the, <laughs> that that's sort of the the biggest space we have for that and when you think about food security and and just you know being able to support local, I, I think they're one of the best on that. Perfect. I mean, guys, feel free to check out all those businesses. Uh, just because Mr. Knack has mentioned them doesn't mean he's necessarily endorsing them because their food might suck. No, I'm kidding. No, uh, Edmonton has like a variety of small businesses, also many businesses that might be franchises, but they're owned by local franchisees. So be sure to support your local restaurants, businesses, artisans, creatives, support everybody in the community. We're all in this together. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Before we wrap it up for tonight, I want to ask you, is there any kind of message that you want to send out to your fans and supporters or even some general information that you want to send out to any of our viewers? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, again, first, thanks for, thanks for having me. This has been a, a, a great conversation and, and it's uh, it's always good to be able to talk about, you know, everything we've discussed because it gives you a chance to sort of reflect on, on what you love about the city and what's, what makes this city, um, so great each and every day and so um less about me i'm not worried about uh any fans or supporters i mean folks can find me on on social media if they if they want to stay connected if they want to chat about um you know their vision for the city i think the main message to leave people with is to to remember that um no matter what what it is you're doing and and again i i try to put myself back in when i was 23 that you have the opportunity to affect change in this city we're very fortunate to be a sort of small big city which means we're we're still building what this city is going to be and uh, and so i hope people f realize that and take advantage of that opportunity whether that being running for city council and making those decisions or getting involved with all of the different groups and organizations that we have across the city um, there no matter what you're interested in there's likely a group ready to to be involved with and to get involved with that can help impact positive change in the city and uh and you may think that just because you know like i did back in when i was first ran just because i wasn't really well connected i hadn't been involved with community leagues at that part at that point um yet yeah, you can still impact change in the city um you, you know you don't have to come you know be a wealthy well-connected person working the downtown elite i think you called me at the <laughs> uh and that's the beauty you don't have to be part of that and, and in fact i think um that's that's what makes edmonton such a wonderful place because no matter where you are no matter where you've come from no matter how long you've been here in the city uh you can help create and build the city and make an even better city than it is today so i hope people just think about that and and stay involved with their with their city and their community of course. 
Uh, one of your colleagues from city council, I believe she's the counselor for Ward 5, Sarah Hamilton. She yeah. mentioned something fascinating to me once a few years ago. She said that, you know, the streets and avenues in Edmonton haven't been named, right? You go to a lot of these old world cities in this continent. And if you go beyond that, like everything is named after some ruler or some builder, some innovator, whoever. But this is the land of opportunity. You want to live the American dream? Come to Edmonton, Alberta, home of the Oilers, home of Amy, uh, home of the University of Alberta, Grant McEwen, Nate, Concordia College. We are the promised land. Like, come here, build your dream, become part of our com ever growing community, and help us move this city forward. I just want to take this moment to give an extra special shout out to uh, Councillor Andrew Knack his assistant, Cheryl, um, everybody who's involved in Team NAC. Go Team NAC. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much to the City of Edmonton, to City Hall. Thank you, Councillor, for taking time out of your busy and arduous schedule to you know chat with us. And yeah, if you'd like to stay in touch with uh, Mr. NAC, check him out on Facebook, social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok even. Um, and yeah, everywhere he is, Andrew Knack. If you like any information about what exactly the city of Edmonton is doing, uh, please check out edmonton.ca and also Councillor Knack's uh, social media channels. If you have any questions about healthcare, uh, please check out Dr. Dina Hinshaw and only rely on official networks from the hospitals, such as the Alberta, uh, like AHS, my, uh, the Misericordia, Grey Nuns, uh, all we respect all of our hospitals, check them all out. And uh, yeah, thank you once again, counselor. Um, is there anything else like you'd like to close us off on? No, oh, just thank okay. you for doing this and thank you for uh, giving us a chance to chat and uh, look forward to seeing uh, the the rest of your future shows and, uh, and everyone that you're going to be connected hey. with. Yeah, you never know. Maybe I'll be the next Joe Rogan. Probably not, but like you'll be like, hey, I, I kind of sort of knew that guy once. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I hope you have a great night and uh, I hope you and your colleagues, you're all safe with your loved ones, okay? Thank you. You too. Thank you very much. Take care, Andrew. Good night. You too. Bye.